Christmas time with some beautiful, beautiful songs and the message of Jesus Christ. Mary, did you know? Thank you, Maddie, and thank you, worship team, and all of you for just really sounding good this morning. Everybody got a little bit of rest, uh, maybe over the weekend, and you're singing beautifully this morning. Wow. Ecclesiastes chapter number five, after a couple of weeks of ministry appreciation and uh, thank you Sunday and using uh, some text out of uh, Ecclesiastes four, we headed off into Ecclesiastes five, you can join me there, we're going to uh, plow through, we're going to have our Sunday morning devotion in Ecclesiastes chapter number five and 20 verses, we're going to cover them and see what God has for us and what God has for you, and, and uh, it should be all warmed up a little bit in the spirit in your time of prayer. You and I come here to, to worship the Lord and uh, to give unto him our hearts and to set apart our lives. Uh, it ties together with this man named Solomon, who, unlike his father, near the end of his life, uh, held back his heart. Bible teaches us that David was a man after God's own heart. His heart was purposed unto God, even through all of his trials, his testing, his own self-imposed difficulties of life from his own sin. David never stopped having his heart after God, and even in the end, near the end of his life, and, and an account, of course, of how the devil got his attention to even go out and count all of his army and all of his people and numbering them when God said, you don't have to do that. Even then, near the end of his life, David still really had a heart after the Lord and was after God's own heart. Solomon, not so much. Solomon in his life, of course, we know that um, in the counting of 1 Kings, that uh, by the time the end of chapter 10 and 11 roll around, beginning of 11, we find that he is now, of course, the richest man. He is the wealthiest man. In the face of the earth, he is the man with the most wisdom. He is the king of the nation of Israel. The nations want his wealth that he has accumulated. Much of his wealth that he has accumulated has been turned out to be falsely as the years went on. He started levying taxes in greater ways. He started gathering chariots and horses, which was against the Deuteronomy law in chapter number 17. He he wasn't to do the things that he went after. He was gathering monies and he was gathering horses and he was gathering, of course, uh, wicked women. He was gathering women that had turned their hearts away from the Lord. And so Solomon, we can safely say, is at a place in writing the book of Ecclesiastes where his heart is away from God. He has forgotten what it's like to have close personal relationship with God. In our study, we realize that we need to search for purpose in everything, to realize that Jesus Christ has to be the centerpiece of our purpose in all things that we do, and we need to search through things and look through things and find out whether or not God wants us in the midst of us, or we could end up in the middle of life like Solomon, in the midst of a mess without God, and that's a tough place to live, and we know as God's people, even off of the last couple of weeks, and being thankful for God's people and God's family and the mission work and being involved in ADP sports and, and what we do on Sundays and during the week, it really is the heart of God. It's you having this desire to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service to serve him, to minister with God's desires in your heart as you have the desire of God to minister to other people and to minister the gospel. That's what makes a difference. Again, this study puts us in a place where we can really see what it can be like to have a life knowing the Lord, but really not having Jesus Christ at the centerpiece of all that we do we could definitely say life is vanity, life is full of vexation of spirit. Oh gosh, the problems of life are so tough. The monotony of life, the vanity of having all this wisdom. Oh gosh, to have the monies that we have, the futility of, oh gosh, all this wealth. And, and then the certainty of death, it could be seemingly meaningless without really seeing the Lord Jesus in everything. 
Our theme verses, of course, are up on the screen. We make sure to visit them every single time we get into this study just to be reminded that Solomon did say that he gave his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. But he came to this statement. He said, this sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. And you could actually say, well, that's a, a negative context. But God's saying, I put you on this earth to search things out, to seek things out. Ultimately, you should find me, the creator, not just be in love with the creation and all the things that I've made which are so good, because he said, this is good, this is very good at the end of his creation when he brought to the time of Genesis chapter number one and the seventh day he rested, he said everything was good and very good. God made all these things and he made them for us in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. But in all those good things that we could think about, all those things, we, we realize sometimes that we really come up short in doing the due diligence, the hard work, the searching the scriptures daily. We find ourselves asking God for answers in life, and yet we don't search out for purpose the things that he has before us. We don't look for purpose in everything. And this morning, my prayer and hope as I come to preach and teach the word of God once again is that you're looking for God's purpose and things, that you're listening to God, that you need to hear God. Yeah, you may hear my voice, but I want you to hear the voice of God in our scripture teaching. I want you to learn from the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to walk out and have a fervor to search things out deeper and just not look at, hey, life is wonderful, that's good, or life is hard, and that's good, and, and, and that's it. It's no, God has put so many things before you, before you and me, the church, the family, the bride of Christ, the gospel, all the work, the word of God. There's so much good that God has made. But I wonder, as the title of our message today sound, sends, sends this message, that good things can end up becoming bad. That's chapter 5 for us. Good things can become bad. What do you mean? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions after I make this really quick statement that's up on the screen. God has given us many good things to enjoy, as I've been saying in our introduction. Yet, there are times when a good thing turns into a bad thing. What do you mean? How many of you are homeowners? Could you raise your hand real quick? Now, don't you love your house? Don't you? How many of you have a house that's older than 20 years old? Raise your hand. Are you tired of it yet? And then 25 years old, and then 30 years old. But those of you who have like houses that are really young, you go, oh, this is the best thing. It's such a good thing. Then they get old, just like our bodies. And when the houses are 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, it's not such a good, this good thing now turns into, oh, I got to do the roof, I got to do the gutters, I got to do this, I got to do that. I think that we need to sell the house and buy some place, Cheryl, that we can just have somebody else take care of things. What do you think? What do you think? And she'd say, I don't do anything around the house anyway. Why is it such a burden to me? I don't <laughs> A good thing can turn into a bad thing. A good relationship with someone can turn into a bad thing if we don't treat it properly. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. He's given you so many gifts. He's given us so many gifts. Around in this room, you have so many good friends, but if we do not treat that good friendship properly, it can turn into a bad relationship. Good ministry opportunities could turn into bad ones if our hearts get a little bit twisted or... Some things go wrong and we don't deal with it. So sometimes the good things from God turn into bad things. So I ask you, why do the good things of God become underappreciated? Going back to the last two weeks, and turn into cursings instead of blessings. You see, that's kind of what happened to Solomon's life. Solomon got to a point where he didn't appreciate 
God in everything. It was under the sun, under the heaven. Yes, of course, we look at those things in this earth that way and say, okay, under the heavens, under the sun, yes. But he left God out of things, and when you leave God out of things and you're not appreciative, and we had ministry appreciation Sunday, we don't say thank you to God. We had a give thanks picnic in the summertime, going up and acknowledging somebody and rejoicing in them and saying thank you for what you do. I acknowledge what you did. I thank you for that. But when we become unappreciative it to God, we even say, God, <laughs> thank you for the mess you put me in. I heard in the Bible it's a good thing to find a wife, but now I wonder, <laughs> I don't know, if I really should have found her, maybe you need to, <laughs> need to unfind her for me. Why do good things of God become underappreciated and turn into cursings instead of blessings? It says in Proverbs, and you can look up, of course, I pull Proverbs for our intro quite often because Solomon wrote so many of them. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. See it right there, a merciful person, someone that extends mercy, they do good to their own soul. Now, you hold back mercy that God has given you to give to others, what happens? He that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. When you don't have that goodness of mercy unto others and into your own soul, it troubles you. Then, again, a good thing turns into something bad. Mercy being held back. Mercy being merited in some certain way. Mercy is so good, yet when it's withheld, it's cruel. It says in Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. What do you mean? Why is that a good thing turning into bad? Very simply this. Someone who has a good spirit, a wonderful attitude, a, a neat, really great countenance, it does good to people. It's like having a, a, a nice, sweet elixir of just sweet sugar, People make things better that have a merry heart. But a broken spirit, it dryeth the bones. Maybe there's something troubling in someone, so their attitude and their heart now is more troubled and then becomes a difficulty, a bad thing. You see, the book of Proverbs talks about good doctrine, a good name, good news, a good report, a good word. You could have good words and then turn those good words into bad words. A good name turns into a bad name. Good doctrine turns into bad doctrine. You see, there's a lot of good things. And in the text, you're about to see that Solomon had lots of good stuff here that he now sees and turned into in his attitude, possibly, in his heart, possibly, seeing the bad for us. We need to see the good and keep these good things and remain in the place where we recognize God's incredible favor and grace. What happens in our countenance and in our heart when we leave God's goodness out and withhold blessings from others? What happens? Question, ponder, think. Good things can become bad things. What happens in your countenance and in your heart, in my heart, when I leave God's goodness out of something and I withhold the blessing from other people? It then becomes not so good. So many people, I believe, just suffer through a daily dose of not good. Maybe not even very bad, just not good. And sometimes it's just our heart, our continence, our, our, just our, our way, our spirit, our thinking, our attitude of saying, I don't know, God, I guess you're there, and I understand you're there, but I don't think you're hearing my prayers. I think you're good to me. In fact, I know you've been good to me in the past, but I don't know if you're being good to me right now. And I leave God out, and all of a sudden, I'm not that blessing to other people like I ought to be. You see, good things can become bad. See, life, very simply, is good. God has given you this beautiful life. He has said, here, this is my life, my gift to you. What will you do with this beautiful, good thing? 
Will you be thankful, as it says in Deuteronomy 26, and thou shalt rejoice in every good thing, which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee, and unto thine house, thou and the Levite, and the stranger that is among you. Remember, when you think about those good things, we remember in Psalm 92 that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will, be, will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. God gives. And we have all these good things in our lives. This life is a good life. It really is. Because it was given from the giver of life. You're born again this morning. It's not that you just have breath. Not that your lungs are just filled right now with air. That your heart is beating. That the blood is flowing. And all the physical thing is going, is going well. That you're... Thank you, God. It's so much more beyond that as a new creation, a new creature in Christ. That old thinking, that old way, old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're a new creature in Christ. You have this new life in Christ. And you and I are in a much better place, in a much different spot than Solomon. But we can slip back in. And the good things can become bad things. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Let's go and walk through and do our daily devotion on Sunday. I'm going to go through the first seven verses and the next couple and kind of make some highlights here and see what these next 20, 20 verses have for us. Join me. Verse number 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Pay attention to the mention of God here in the next few verses. He mentions God quite a bit, which means that maybe Solomon is trying to be a little religious here. Okay, pay attention, because he hasn't mentioned God very much in his writing and his preaching message to the people of Israel in Ecclesiastes. Verse 2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Verse 5, better it is, excuse me, better is it, that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was in an error. Wherefore, should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also divers vanities, but fear thou God. Just my first devotional thought here. This is a warning about the mouth. You say, well, wait a minute, it's about vows, and it's about being religious, and it's about Solomon's attempt to do some things and say some things in his religious status. Yes, but I see the mention that refers to our mouth, our voice, our words quite often here in these seven verses as we take them and look at them. The vow, when you vow something, you speak it. And of course, we know the importance of that vow. Remember that God is showing us very clearly through Ecclesiastes' preaching message that a religious effort apart from the centerpiece of worshiping God is just vanity, it's just foolishness, just you know, I tried that for a lot of years, and maybe some of you are still trying that. Even say, hey, well, I got saved. I'm born again when I was a kid or when I was a young adult. But I just, I'm just trying to do some religious stuff. I'm just trying to get by. I'm doing a couple good works. I just want to have a decent life. And Solomon is showing us in his writing and his preaching by the Spirit of God here, very simply, religion can be very, very empty when it is filled with just words, dreams, voices, thoughts, vows that mean nothing. Can you imagine that we would say something to God like he was just 
some type of stone or rock or monument. We come forward in the invitation. I wonder if some people do not respond to an invitation time, a time to come to the altar, a time to pray, because, hey, I don't want to vow a vow to God and defer to pay it. I would not want to do that. Well, good, good. But how about getting in the position, each one of us, where we would vow something with our words and mean it to God, that we would mean it to our spouse, that we would mean it to our children, when we said, I'm going to do this and then follow through. How many of you, right in your own heart, would say, boy, there's times that I said that I would do something to my children, do it to my family, do it for people that I know, and I fell through, and I told them, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. I got you. But we're talking about vows to God here. How many vows have I made to God that I did not follow through as though he was just like some wall or some wood? He's the living God of creation and glory. I need to have a warning about how I use my mouth and how I speak because my words are important. Every one of our words are important. And he even says in verse 4, for he hath no pleasure in fools. God doesn't have pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is that shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth. Don't let your mouth cause you and your flesh to sin. The old phrase, don't overload your mm with your mm. Don't do it. Don't put yourself in a position which you can't follow through with something. And of course, spouses, don't commit your spouse to something that you know they're not going to want to do. Hey, honey, we're going over to so-and-so's house today. No, we're not. Well, I committed there. We're going, no, you better get us out of that. <sighs> but I vowed. No, you'd better not vow. It says in James chapter number 3, you know the reference, verse number 5 through 10, even the whole first 10 verses. Even so the tongue is a little member, boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It goes on and on, the tongue among our members, that if it defile the whole body, set it on fire the course of nature. It's a warning for our mouths that then James is bringing out in the New Testament. It says in verse number 10 of James chapter number 3, out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Oh God, forgive me. Oh God, forgive us. A warning from Solomon about our mouth. Here we are in verses number 8 and 9. What's our next thought that we have? Verse number 8 and 9, if thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province. Marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. Up there I put, hey, this is a warning about the poor. How do the poor get treated? How do we treat the poor? Have we in our minds just disregarded the poor people? You say, well, if these governments were not like they were, are, and going to be because they're run by men and there's corruption in so many of the governments, it wouldn't be so bad. But isn't it even better that at least there's some governmental order in some form or fashion in some place is what it's saying. Verse number 9 is telling us one day the king of kings, hey, listen, the land is under the king. Well, one day the king of kings is going to be over all the land and he will be the just government. He will make sure everything is just and right. So just consider this, a warning about the poor. Sometimes we don't pay attention to what the poor are all about and what their needs. Some people just tip it off or they do things just so people can see them do things for the poor. Even the government just hands out maybe a few things and says, hey, poor, take care of yourselves. I'll be fine. In fact, I'll get in front of a TV screen and I'll make sure everybody knows how wonderful I am as a government official taking care of the poor. Hey, guess what? Solomon's saying, See the oppression of the poor, violent, perverting of judgment and justice in province. This is almost 3,000 years ago, and he's pointing out that government and their justice and their judgment in provinces is wrong. Marvel not at the matter. Verse 9, no more over the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. Guess what? There are always going to be people under someone who's an authority on this earth running things. Don't steal for them. Don't hurt them. Don't oppress them even more. 
Jesus Christ did it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Verse number 2, Matthew chapter number 6. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they'll have their reward. But when thou Thus doest alms, let not thine left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward them openly. A warning about the poor. Be there for them. Do that which we ought to do for them, but know they're under governmental rule, and they will face an oppressive leadership for century upon century upon century because man can be very devious, deceitful, and hurt the poor because they're already down. Solomon's pointing it out. What about just serving others? How about if just do something for the poor? Hey, that's a warning. The poor you'll have with you always. It was said in the Gospels. Here we go. We continue in verse number 10 and 11. What's our next thought here from verses 10 and 11? I believe I've also got up there Verse number 12. It says here, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if somebody dropped off some silver at your house this afternoon? Oh, wait a minute, right now, while you're at church, somebody's going to drop off about a million dollars worth of silver. Will you be happy? No? Yeah, Patrick Mahomes decided he's going to give up all of his salary to everybody. He's got a half a billion, Right? Well, that would be before taxes. The government will get. But here's the thinking. Wow, wait a minute. The Bible's saying, Solomon's saying, that even though you get silver, you won't be satisfied. <laughs> he ought to know. He kept on going after it. Again, 1 Kings chapter number 10, you can be reminded of it. Nor he that loveth abundance with increase, this is also vanity. Somebody says, boy, I got so much, I want more. That can, that can get every one of us, verse number 11. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? Verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Think about this real quick. Think about this. It says up on the screen this. Here's a warning about wealth. Wealth is good. There's nothing wrong with it. To have a lot of stuff, have lots of monies. I mean, we're doing pretty good as Americans. You know in some of the statistics and things like that when you pull up different articles, it says in an article in the Washington Post in 2018, most Americans vastly underestimate how rich they are compared with the rest of the world. Does it matter? It says in this article, now this is 2018, and they're going back a ways and getting their numbers. So what did they say? Americans profoundly underestimate. The average U.S. Re uh, resident in this time, three years ago, estimated that the global median individual income is about $20,000 a year. In fact, the real answer is about a tenth of that figure. In 2018, roughly $2,100 per year was the worldwide global median individual income. Similarly, Americans typically place themselves in the top 37% of the world's income distribution. However, the vast majority of U.S. residents rank comfortably in the top 10%. That means that you and I have been blessed, have been given a good thing in wealth. Warning from Solomon. What can happen with all that beautiful wealth? You see, it goes, about, goes without saying that when I have something, I might want more. As it says in verse number 11, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. The warning about wealth and this really, really neat thing is this. Personal wealth for everyone, I think, is just treated differently. Some people see having uh, $100 in the savings and $500 in their checking account as just being fine. I've got plenty of wealth. I'm doing well. Others would say, boy, I, I need to have $5,000 in my savings. I need to have $10,000 in my checking account, 
That usually is a person that has daughters, so I understand that completely. But some might say, boy, I got one car and I'm good, but if some, some say I got to have two or three or four cars, I need to have different cars. Again, if you're a parent that's had teenagers and you got four or five in the driveway, I can understand. You see, that is relative to me in looking at this text. The key is this. Wealth can really bring you a peace of mind. If everything's paid for, the bills are taken care of, that's what, hey, he's saying that. But over the years, we realize that wealth can also be debilitating. There's quotes of different famous rich people that had all this wealth, and by the end of their lives, they were tragically miserable on their own. Even like uh, some in the Rockefeller family or things like that would be quoted as saying they were miserable, they didn't want to be around people because basically their wealth had eaten them up. To me, it is a good warning about wealth as Solomon gives us this warning. Again, good things can turn into something bad. They can become bad in every one of us. So here is verses 13 through 17. Let's grab this package here because you're going to see something that moves from wealth to something even more difficult. Verse 13 says, There is sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. And he, excuse me, as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil, that at all points as he came, so shall he go, and what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? He's spoken of this before, of earning and making money, giving it over to someone who's after you, labored and have all the things, and yet there's nothing left at the end. He says in verse number 17, all his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. Warning, a warning about greed. You say, I don't have much, so it's hard to be greedy. Or I have everything that I need is something that wouldn't happen to me. A good thing is wealth. A bad thing would be greed. When we get to a point where we become so covetous over other things that we think we have to have, that gets us in a place where, again, verse number 13, there's a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, Solomon says, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Old preachers used to say, make all you can, save what you can, give away what you can. You see, sometimes we forget that God's principle setting up right here beautifully in the idea that Solomon again got himself in trouble He broke the command in Deuteronomy 17. He's already the richest guy. He's already the wisest guy. He has the biggest army. Everybody wants what he has, and yet he went after more. Nations came and donated things and gave him things, and then those nations saw all that he had, and they went to war against him. And God brought war against this man. He gave him exactly what he went after. Contention, fighting, because he provoked God and gathering chariots and horsemen and riches and abundance and gathering huh, all these strange women, 700 wives and 300 concubines. The wives turned away his heart. And as it says in 1 Kings eleven four, his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father, as I mentioned in our introduction. A warning about greed, a warning about wealth. You and I, we can get to that place where we can just hold on to things. And God says, save yes, earn yes, save yes, give away yes. That's a good way to live. And in the last three verses, verse number 18 through 20, 
Behold, that which I have seen, verse 18, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which, here we go, the mention of God, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. It seems as though, again, there's an acknowledgement of God here. Verse number 19, every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. I like this. Here's old Solomon giving credit and honor to God. Verse 20, for he shall not much remember the days of his life because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. Wow, Solomon, see Solomon had closeness with God. This is the one that stood up before the people and in, in, in dedicating the temple, the house of the Lord, and spoke of beautiful words unto the Lord and his holiness. He still had an acknowledgement of God. He's saying, here, I warn you about your blessings. I warn you about all the blessings that you have. We have so many blessings and the principle of thankfulness and acknowledgement and appreciation. Sometimes people complain about their blessings. They complain about their children. They complain about their grandchildren. We complain about what God's given us. Warning about your blessings. Be thankful for them. Or God may take them away. I hear, young boy, I'm getting old, I'm getting so old. You better be thankful for every birthday you have, because one day God may say you don't get any more birthdays. Be thankful for the years that you have. Be thankful. Oh, I'm so miserable. I'm so old and grumpy. Yes, you are. Be joyful and be thankful. Be thankful. When we're thankful for the blessings, it changes our countenance completely. I know that life can be tough. I know that life can be hard. Some of you are going through some really tough things. I got you. I'm with you. Sometimes, as Solomon's bringing to light here, we need to be warned about our blessings. Verse 19, every man also to whom God has given riches and wealth, most of us in America, and have given him power to eat thereof. Thank you, God, that I sit in a home and I can do so, and take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Warning about blessings. Be thankful. Be appreciative. Acknowledge God. And don't stop doing it. Well, I gave God thanks last week. Oh, I know the Bible says in everything give thanks, but you don't know my plight and my difficulty. No, I don't. I know you're probably going through some tough things. But we don't want the good things to turn into bad. We don't want the good things to become bad. Because when they do, oh my, we get turned upside down and now we're backwards. And we don't want to be in a place where we're backwards. So that's our morning devotion. Okay? So I just have two simple things for you for a couple minutes. Just, just two simple pieces of a lesson out of what happens and the good things. And I'm going to bring it to a place of a couple, two passages of Scripture that God just led me to here in this study. And you say, where does this tie together? You'll see it. Because I believe Solomon lost something. He lost something that he knew. He knew the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, Joshua, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Solomon knew the scriptures. The Bible tells us he was the wisest. So many of you know the scriptures. So many of you know the Bible. So many of you are in a place where you've memorized a Bible verse or two or three. You know Bible lessons. Thank you, God. And if you don't know so much, you may think that you don't know you, you probably just know enough to know that a couple things are going to come back around today here in these two simple lessons at the end. So the first piece I just want to say, two, two, two little lessons here. First one, good things become bad when our relationship with Jesus Christ no longer embraces the fear of the Lord, but rather becomes a place for taking him for granted. 
I'll just sit on that for a minute. Solomon took him for granted. Solomon knew the commands of the word of God, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. He knew the Levitical law. Numbers, Deuteronomy, he knew all that was in Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. He knew what was taught there. He was smart enough to know it. He had wisdom, knowledge, understanding, but sometimes just having it, <laughs> it doesn't do any good. Wisdom is the principal thing. We know knowledge, go after knowledge. The Bible tells us that is a good thing. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 30 with me. You'll need your Bible. I don't have the verses up on the screen, so pop it in there for you. Deuteronomy chapter number 30. You remember, if you ever took any type of lessons or any type of teaching over the years about what it meant to raise your children and how to raise them and pass things on, and then be in a book like Deuteronomy where Moses is basically preaching three messages over the course of his time near the end to the nation of Israel. He knows that God is taking out <laughs> the older are dying off, the younger are going to be going into the promised land. This is the second giving the law of the law, as I mentioned. And here near the end of Deuteronomy, we're reminded of how powerful, how amazing our God is, and how merciful he is, how good he is, how kind he is. And what he says here, we're going to pick it up in verse number 15, but I even blocked off verse number 11 down because there's a paragraph format there for this is the commandment. But we'll go to verse number 15. Follow along with me. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them. I denounce you this day, that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. Verse number 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that thou that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, verse 20, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. This is a good thing. He is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto the fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Pastor, you're just giving me an Old Testament promise for the nation of Israel. What good does that do for me? Those people probably are in the same place that oftentimes you are. Oh, if I got to hear one more time to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, all that Moses does is go on and on and on about loving God, I wonder why. I wonder why. I really wonder why. Because Solomon... His heart went away from God, and he loved, the Bible says, strange women. He loved idols. He loved strange and gathered strange women. He gathered riches. He gathered horses. He gathered power. He gathered lands. He kept on gathering and gathering and gathering. Good things become bad when our relationship with Jesus Christ no longer embraces the fear of the Lord, but rather becomes a place for taking him for granted. The nation of Israel, many of them, took him for granted, just like you and me, just like today, oftentimes. See, God's good in life is even gooder. It's not bad when we simply love God in return for how he loves us. We are to live faith, love others, declare hope. That's what we come together to do. So now you've got to go out and do that, and you've got to remind yourself to do it, and you've got to force yourself to do it. Because guess what? 
fake, phony, hollow, empty, vanity type of life and religiosity will show up in such a way that relationships will be completely bankrupt of love, of joy, of peace, and you'll be in a place and we'll be in a place where a good thing, this salvation, this love, this grace, this goodness, the fruit of the Spirit will be a bad thing because it will not be poured out of you into other people. The gospel you have will stay in you. And all the good that God has done in your life, you'll end up in a place and I'll end up in a place just like Solomon, where the good things become bad. In my relationship with Jesus, we need to just see that our relationship with Jesus, there's nothing more important. There really isn't. Good things become bad. When we just see our relationship there's no longer fear of the Lord. Oh, I, I, I'll just, God is so forgiving. I, I, again, I, I've used this many a time in youth ministry. Teenagers used to tell me, well, I know that the Bible teaches that neither death nor life nor angels. Hey, listen, nothing can separate me from the love of God which is Christ Jesus. I've got eternal security, man. And I'll tell you what, I hope that he just holds on to me because I'm having an awful time. I mean, I'm just going to play with sin a little bit. Oh, dear Jesus, do you not know, do I not know the fear of the Lord? And how I know what I can get in the middle of. Oh God, I can get in the middle of. When I don't fear the Lord in the healthy, beautiful, right way. I stop loving him like he deserves to be loved. And truly, I don't have any love to love anybody else because I can't even muster up the love that he's put in me from Jesus Christ to love him back. I've quenched that and grieved that and hurt that. Oh, gosh. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. And then the second piece of our lesson to finish up. Good things become bad when our relationship with this world no longer embraces the mission field. Now, this is fresh off the Acts 1A conference. We're still in that mode here. We built beds for sleep and heavenly peace, put a lot of energy corporately and collectively into charity golf tournament, salt and light, passing out things, knocking on doors, inviting people to our church. Good things go bad and become bad when our relationship with this world no longer embraces the mission field, but rather becomes a playground for our lustful flesh. We're prone to it. I'm drawn to it. Sometimes, I mean, life is good. The blessings from God are incredible. God's warned me about the blessings, the wealth. He warned me about my mouth and how it can be used for good or for bad. Go to Luke chapter number 10 as we finish up in this text. In the Gospels, love is brought up by the Lord Jesus Christ quite a bit. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he recites, reiterates the message of Deuteronomy, to love the Lord thy God, Exodus. In Luke's rendition by the Holy Spirit, he gives us a little bit extra. Because in the audience that Jesus has, when he speaks this to a Jewish man, he takes it a little bit further. Verse number 25, chapter number 10 of Luke's Gospel And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Who, by the way, said that? The lawyer said it. The lawyer knew. He answered, 
Then Jesus Christ says in verse number 28, he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, of course, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Here's the mission field. That can either be a playground for my lustful flesh or a beautiful place that God has given me by his love to go into with the gospel of life change of Jesus Christ. He says in verse number 30, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, having, excuse me, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. We would say that this one, this man saw this world as a place for his playground of his lustful flesh. What do you mean? He didn't go off and do some awful... He lustfully decided to worship himself and not be attached to this man to clean him up, to do something for him. How terrible to think that that would be something that could happen from a priest. Verse number 32, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. The same thing in Jesus' teaching, this story Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, here it is, he had compassion on him. We can't read that enough to see that he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again I will repay. Wow. Love is good. Love is kind. Charity. Love is all those things. And God's love in that Samaritan person was revealed in Jesus' story and Jesus' accounting of making sure that this lawyer knew the truth of what it ought to be like to do something and move upon the command. Verse number 36 and 7. Here we have the response. He says, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Verse 37, he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise, Solomon, and all those that heard everything that he said in Ecclesiastes. See, Solomon had forgotten his kingship servanthood that he was supposed to have for the people he was about getting for himself. I fear that oftentimes we get stuck in the same mode as Solomon. We may not be kings like Solomon was of Israel, but the Bible teaches us that we are royalty. Yes, we are in Jesus. We're joint heirs with the king. We are a royal priesthood. And when good things become bad, usually there's something having to do with the place where our relationship with this world no longer embraces this mission field that we have but rather becomes a playground for our apathy, our selfishness, our laziness, our lustful flesh. I'm not to withhold God's love from other people. What is this world to you and me? Is it a platform for wealth? Or is it a platform to be a witness? What is this? New life that you've been given, which is so good. This world you live in is so good. There's no place like where you live. It's so good. Don't let it allow, don't allow anything to turn it into something bad because good things can become bad. I end you with these couple thoughts here. God's love for us and the love we are to have for him, (laughs) that's really... It's one of the good things. No argument there. It's my safest statement I said today. No argument. 100% would agree. So I ask you this. Has God's love for you, his really good thing, become something you have turned into a bad thing? Please bow for a word of prayer. 
Our Father, uh, this is a good word from your word today, not from my mouth, but from your word. And I thank you in the name of Jesus by your spirit for what we have learned from your Bible, from your scriptures, from Solomon. The preacher put a lot of things before us today, and it comes back to a lot of good things that you provided for us. What am I going to do with? What are we going to do with all these good things? Especially maybe the, the best thing, the goodest thing, your love for us. Your love for us so much that you sent your only begotten son. May we, God, see the fear of the Lord would bring us back to loving you the way we ought to. And that this world that we are put in, we would love it to a place of being our mission field, that we would be witnesses like we've never been before. I pray you'd work in the hearts of your people this morning during this invitation time, during this time of prayer. In Jesus' name, please stand.